Outram is a small town located beyond the Dunedin suburb of Mosgiel at the western edge of the Torrey Plains south of Dunedin. State Highway 87 runs through the town and only a few kilometres beyond its southern boundary begins to climb up the shoulder of Mungatua Hill to Middlemarch, the Strathtorry Valley and on into central Otago. This is one of the favoured historic roads to central Otago and some of Outram's surviving buildings testify to the town's historical nature. A bridge crosses the Torrey River about two kilometres north of Outram at the point where the river runs out of a gorge through the Mungatua Silver Peaks Hills and bisects the plain running from west to east before it turns a right angle to run north to south and then enters the lower Torrey Gorge before meeting the sea. Chief Surveyor of Dunedin, Charles Kettle, organised the first survey of the Torrey in 1847 at the same time that the new town of Dunedin was planned. This survey, however, included only a quarter of the plain's 400,000 acres, excluding all of the West Torrey where Outram is now located. While a few scattered settlers began to move onto the Torrey Plain shortly after Dunedin's first settlers arrived, much of the Torrey Plain was a swamp with only the northern third reusable terra firma. A road to Saddle Hill and then to Ellington was cut in 1849, but the main road to the Torrey was over Halfway Bush and Three Mile Hill. In 1862, Gordon Road was constructed linking Saddle Hill Road to West Torrey and other roads bisecting the swampy plain followed. The nature of the Torrey Plain settlement changed dramatically in mid-1861 with Gabriel Reed's discovery of gold at Gabriel's Gully. One of the routes to this gold field was via West Torrey and the Mungatua's past Waipori. The next year, with the Dunstan discovery, West Torrey became the main route to central Otago via Outram to Clark's Junction and then on to what is now the old Dunstan Road. The settlement of Outram began with the small township that developed beside the site of the Upper Torrey Ferry near the present bridge in the 1850s. This ford was also part of an old Mary Trail Archaeological sites relating to Mary occupation also demonstrate the use of this area by Mary in prehistory. A bridge was built across the Torrey River in 1864, but in 1868 a major flood swept away the little town and the new bridge. The new town of Outram grew up in its wake, with many of the tradesmen from the ferry shifting to the new site. Carting contracts to the Dunstan began with the gold rush, although the development of the Palmerston route to the interior led some traffic away, as did the railway when it was completed. Outram remained the centre of carting industry for nearly 50 years, with industries such as sluicing companies and the Waipori hydroelectric scheme keeping wagons on the road, which was too steep and not suitable for motor vehicles. No doubt, it was this carting industry, along with farming on the plains, that kept the blacksmith and wheelwright on Hoylake Street in business. Outram was also the first town in New Zealand to have electric street lights. As former West Torrey resident Alec Chisholm noted, in the early 20th century there were two blacksmith and wheelwright businesses in town required to keep all the cartage teams and their equipment in operation. Farmers also had their own cartage teams and the two flour mills at Woodside and Outram Glen kept a demand on cartage. It is important not to confuse the two smithies, the one at Hoylake Street and the other Rutherford, later known as Fraser's, on Hollyhead Street. The latter was located in the Outram Township itself and is now the site of the garage in the main street which is also now owned by the Warnock family. The original certificate of title shows that the land on which the blacksmith shop still stands 
was one of a block of eight sections in the township of Outram, sold in 1876. The original owner was John Anderson, likely to be the same John Anderson noted as one of the first settlers of the area, arriving in West Torrey in 1850. Although the finer details of the original certificate of title and following changes of ownership are almost impossible to read, an article in the Otago Daily Times, 2nd of February 1882, records a mortgagee sale of the eight sections, containing two acres together with the dwelling house and blacksmith shop lately occupied by Jazz Grant. The purchaser was David Grant of Granton. David Grant of Granton was a Scottish surveyor whose uncle Peter Grant was one of the first to develop a homestead on the sometimes flooded Tyree Flat. Both the Grant names can be made out on the title but dates cannot be verified. The blacksmith shop noted on the account of the mortgagee sale is very likely the blacksmith shop that still stands on the corner section today, subdivided off the original eight section block. The original blacksmith structure is also likely to have been modified and added to over the years, as photographs demonstrate. In the early 20th century, Alex Chisholm recalled, Black Sandy was the owner of the blacksmith and wheelwright business on the corner of Hoylake and Scary Street, with their house and stables at the rear. Soon the business would be under the ownership of Alex Sandy Walker, newly arrived from the Tyneside, Scotland. Sandy's brother Jim worked with him as a partner in the business. Sandy Walker arrived in New Zealand in 1907 and took over the smithy about this date. He was followed two years later by his father, a wheelwright. There were originally three forges in the workshop. The early blacksmiths known to have worked here were Sandy Alexander, Alex MacDonald and Sandy Walker. Sandy Walker's granddaughter, Helen Matheson, later owned the property. It was from her that Gerald Ralston purchased the smithy before the Warnock family purchased it in 2011. While the structure was in a quite deteriorated state, its forge bellows and some of the other remaining equipment, such as the grinding wheel, were in good condition. The smithy structure consisted of a main section with a gabled roof and a lean-to at the eastern side. Examination of the structure did not reveal which elements may have been original or which may have been more recent additions. The weatherboard cladding on both the western and eastern sides were all in a deteriorated state, with gaps where the boards had rotted away. The corrugated iron in the roof appeared to have been renewed and replaced in different sections. The forge and bellows are located to the left directly inside the sliding entranceway in the northeast corner of the building, while inside the door was a section of wooden cobbles apparently the area used to shoe horses as it was better for their feet. The main section of the structure had only a dirt floor. The interior had an open central section with windows on the western wall with three internal partitions, one at the southern end with stable doors, one at the southeast corner and a third between the corner and the forge. Both these in the lean-to structure. The corner partition had a brick floor, loosely laid and not mortared, some of these bricks impressed with gore. It is possible that the bricks and the loosely laid partition floor may have come from a demolished forge. Bricks were being manufactured in gore by 1887, the year in which advertisements for bricks from the gore kiln. This may account for the gore impressed bricks in the smithy. This former Walker Smithy demonstrates archaeological and heritage values associated with his past function as a blacksmith shop. These values are incorporated in the structure as well as the remaining features and artefacts in the building associated with the trade, 
in particular the forge and bellows. The site is significant as it may be one of the few such remaining structures that once served a small country town and its surroundings. In early 2012, Warnock Architecture started to design a new home and offices for the Warnock family. Although the site or building was not officially listed as protected by the Historic Places Trust, the smithy was built pre-1900, therefore we had to apply for an archaeological authority before any on-site work could proceed. Archaeologist Angela Middleton was engaged to assess and prepare an archaeological assessment which was used for the archaeological authority. In addition to this, the smithy in its original condition was also photographed professionally, site measured and detailed drawings, 3D views and internal 3D virtual tours were produced to further document the history of the smithy. The proposal put forward to the Historic Places Trust was to demolish the back two-thirds of the existing building and retain the working part of the smithy, which included the forge, bellows, timber cobbles, anvil, stone wheel and workbench. The Historic Places Trust looked at this proposal favourably and gave a verbal OK to the proposal. It was at this point the design process for the new home began. It was proposed that the new house was to surround the smithy on the north and west sides, connected with large glazed areas to look in on the old smithy. The challenge in the design was to try and add a new family home to an existing 120 year old building without completely overtaking the main focus of the historical site, the smithy. Several concepts were considered and initially it was thought to minimise the impact on the smithy that the addition should have a low pitched roof surrounding the building. This would ensure that the smithy would be the main focus from the streetscape. However, this concept gave a contemporary feel to the design and after some careful consideration and consultation with other professional colleagues, it was suggested that we should look to embrace the original form of the smithy's roof and it was decided to design a pavilion style building with flat roof areas linking to the smithy and also continue the gable and lean-to roof to the west over the bedroom wing. This allowed the smithy to remain largely as a standalone building, seemingly detached from the new residence. Dark colours and cedar weatherboards were incorporated into the design to complement the existing building. Just before the winter of 2012, it was decided to sell our existing home and move on to the site in caravan with a one and a half year old girl and an eight year old boy. This decision was made with full consultation with my wife, therefore no complaints could be made by anyone, or that was the theory anyway. In April 2013, all consent to an archaeological authorities were approved and the demolition started on the existing smithy, carefully salvaging what materials we could to be reused on the new building and restoration of the smithy. Once materials were salvaged, the back section of the building was pulled down by our trusty Ford Ranger truck and stacked by hand to the corner of the site. The waste materials were then surprisingly snapped up by many locals and saved us a lot of dumping fees. Earthworks then started under the careful eye of the archaeologist to ensure all items of interest were collected and recorded. A few items were discovered including an old rubbish hole containing women's shoes, paint tins and cosmetics amongst others. Fortunately nothing of real significance was found to hold up the construction. We 
extra wide strip footings were then poured due to the silty nature of the outram ground with poly block foundation and poly under slab insulation added. In slab pipe work was installed to all living and tiled areas which provides underfloor heating along with wall mounted convector heaters. The hot water for the system is provided by an air source heat pump unit which also heats the domestic hot water. By mid-May the pre-nailed framing had arrived on site which included 140mm wide external framing for extra wall insulation and allowed the framing to overhang the concrete slab and finish flush with the poly foundation providing good slab edge insulation. The main structure continued to go up while the family battled through the winter months which made for some interesting times and by now our wee girl had forgotten all about home living and was well used to the gypsy life, although the rest of the family was not. The house was then clad in a mixture of alpine tray roofing dark cedar and plaster. We were finally able to move into the house in November 2013 and the gypsy village got pulled down and the long weekends of landscaping began. We have really enjoyed this project and it was a real challenge to try and preserve this wonderful piece of architectural history and we have enjoyed the many people who have come to look at the smithy including many relatives of the past blacksmiths who are very thankful that the smithy still remains. I would like to thank you all for watching.